you think of politics and humanitarian work here in Charleston, you think of Linda Kettner. In this special edition of Quintess Close Ups, I speak exclusively with her one on one. Linda. Hey, you. Good to see you. Nice to see you. Yes, ma'am. Always. 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 It's a pleasure. Uh, you know, as we sit here right now, we just really, the entire country just went through a holiday season. Yes. And I went on your Facebook page because you said something very in 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 intriguing to me on December 22nd. You said this quote, to those facing their first Christmas without a beloved parent, I hurt with you. Tell me as we sit here right now, how hurt are you right now after the loss of your father, Ralph Kettner? I didn't know you were going to ask me that. It's real raw. It will be for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, he was my best friend. Yes. He was my hero. We talked every day. Um, I have folders full of of notes that dad wrote me and and you know almost every other day I'd get something in the mail from him that mm -hmm. he had he had read and oh you could be interested in this or so it's a huge hole in my life he was he's the best man I've ever known in my life okay and and yeah I'm prejudiced but if even if I I could find volumes of people that would say yes he is that yes. you know and um, I just loved him dearly and uh, I was with him I moved to North Carolina for three months mm -hmm. um, to go through his illness with him. Thankfully, it was only three months. He deserved that. He was uh, going to be 96 in September. Wow. And um, he kept his mind throughout and his good disposition. I couldn't believe it. You know, there was, there's indignity with dying mm -hmm. and being ill. And even in that situation, my dad was just a model of who people... Um, the best in people. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I miss him so much. I do. I do. Thank you for asking. Oh, yeah, no worries. And as we say right now, how is your mom doing dealing with the passing of him? Well, see, they've been split since I was 30, which was more wow. than eight years ago. <laughs> and, <laughs> and she remarried and lost her husband oh, uh, shortly after I lost the election. Oh. And uh, I've been taking, she has Alzheimer's and uh, she's in her, going into her ninth year. So it's hard. That's very, very hard. And it's very much um, my life because she's in the home, okay, and I'm up in Georgetown where yeah. she lives mm -hmm. a whole lot. And that's hard. But most of the time, she's happy and uh, that's all I want. Mm -hmm. I just want her to be happy, you know. Well, you know, on a personal note, my grandmother has Alzheimer's oh, yeah? and, oh, yeah, Alzheimer's and dementia. And I guess she's had this since, gosh, I'm 32 now, of course. Yeah. But I would say for 20 years now. And oh, due, wow. Yeah. And due to the grace of God, she's still alive. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, she's in a nursing home, of course. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it's difficult for my mom, but she's there missing her every weekend. So yeah. I, I completely understand your pain. Yeah. You yeah. sure do. You sure do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to turn from personal tragedy to politics. Okay. As you know, the That's talk... That's pretty yeah. much a personal tragedy. Too. Okay. <laughs> Well, talk to me more about that because how would you describe Donald Trump right now? Oh, good Lord. Um, you know, I'm very concerned because I don't think he's a good person. I really don't. I think he lacks character. Mm. And um, that disturbs me because I don't think he's who America wants to present our face to the world as. I don't think he is an example to our children. I think he's, he's very crude. I think he's morally, you know, he bragged about his infidelities when he was married and the the tapes that we've seen, right. either Howard Stern and the other one, are disgusting. I think he, uh, he's, uh, the way he feels about women and talks about them is, is something we don't want children to model. I think he's, um, he is grandiose, okay, in his, you know, I know more than the generals, yada, yada, yada. He plays fast and loose with the facts constantly. Um, I, I think he lacks impulse control. So, you know, at 3 a.m. he'll tweet something. Or instead of talking to people, he'll tweet. Right. I think he's inexperienced. I don't think he is intellectually curious so that he can make up that inexperience because of that grandiosity where he feels like he already knows everything. So all these things are deeply concerning to me. I think he, his communication style is rambling. I, I just... I just don't understand how we got here. I mm. truly don't, that he is uh, our American president. And I know that I said on Facebook right. right after he was elected that that I wanted to give him a chance. And then the first thing he does is come out with the head of Breitbart, Steve right. Bannon, 
as his chief strategist. And Breitbart is, it is, yellow journal, journalism is too good for it. it it's Nazis. It, well, Steve Bannon said that he was the platform for the alt-right, which are Nazis and anti-Semitic people and sexist and, and everything that I thought we had grown or were growing beyond. Mm. Then, with each successive nominee for his cabinet right. positions, I got more concerned. And there's, there's, uh, there's not much in terms of his cabinet. They, they, his cabinet choices are threatening to almost everything I care about. You look at the choices he's made around energy, the three right. positions for energy. Right. All three of them are climate change deniers where we're on the edge of not being able to bring ourselves, the planet, back from climate change. The, the head of the EPA wants to uh, eliminate uh, the restrictions on carbon emissions for power plants. It's, it's just beyond description or belief. I'm very concerned about the new education choice. DeVos, who, by the way, speaking of pay to play, which he had a lot to say about, gave six million dollars to his PAC. Um, she wants vouchers for and to replace you know money that goes to public education so that as a private citizen a middle upper middle and rich person can get money from the government at the public expense taxpayer expense to help their children go to private school the yeah. trouble is the gap between what private school cost the tuition right. and the small voucher only makes that usable by people who already have enough money and to me, public education is the source of the American dream. If you don't have an exceptional public education system, then there's no way out of poverty, really. There's mm -hmm. no way to grab on to the American dream and excel. Mm -hmm. So time after time, position after position that he's choosing, Jeff Sessions as the Attorney General, um, it, you know, the Attorney General's job, large job, is to protect civil rights for right. people. Right. Well, he's already been, in the 80s, he was up for review for federal judgeship, and his racist remarks cost him the ability to get the federal judgeship. Now he's, he's up for attorney general. He's against uh, a whole lot of things that I care about. He voted against voting rights. He voted against uh, LGBT inclusion for hate crimes. I mean, this, this, is, this is a man that probably will turn the role of the attorney general around and focus on... Um, immigration and getting people out of the United States. So again, I, I am deeply disturbed by his choices, by his uh, character. Mm. Yeah, deeply. Two things stuck out to me when I was, when I actually was, was listening to you, that is. And one thing is this, are you concerned about now Governor Nikki Haley becoming the United States Ambassador to the UN? Actually, she looks better than almost all the rest of the choices. I'm not kidding. Okay. I, I really believe that. I think she she is uh, a better choice than just about any, you know, puzzler mm. who is, I think, I think I've got the name right. Let me check that. Yeah, nominee for Secretary of Labor. Wow. You know much about him? Uh, I heard bits and pieces. Yeah, of him. CEO of the companies that franchise Hardee's. And I, the thing I know about Hardee's right now is big fat burgers looking for a heart attack and women who don't have any clothes on, you know, getting wet. The commercials are real sexist, and, mm. he, and he made the comment about that, that, that he, he thought that uh, he liked burgers and he liked women in bikinis, you know, advertising them, and he thought that was very American. And I think that's maybe what they think is very American, but the Secretary of Labor, who was supposed to protect workers uh, in our country, this guy fights even a $10 minimum wage, fights the overtime compensation law, and uh, the AFL-CIO president said that he, uh, his whole business career had been against workers. So, you know, yes, Nikki Haley looks good. She looks good. And you talk about what's really American. What's American in your mind? Oh, God. These days. These days are what I would like for it to be because they're two different things. Okay. You know, I, Quentin, I get it that coal miners out of work and manufacturing jobs with people out of work, that they're worried about taking care of their children and their family and being able to educate them and get them the health care they need. Right. I totally understand that. 
um, and I understand that they're scared and angry and that the country let them down because they promised them retraining and didn't give it to them. So that they've just been out in the cold about that. I do get that. And I just would like to see the, the response to that be a real commitment for retraining, a real focus on finding these people the kind of jobs that guarantees them security for their family. That's what I think America is about. I think uh, Trump has un and his ilk uh, have unleashed an anger and a bitterness and a crudeness um, in this country that I've never seen anything like it in my, you know, 1,200 years on the planet. Um, it's, it's, it's alarming. I think we're better than that. Um, I think, look, I think the universe presents us challenges on purpose, that God presents challenges to us on purpose. Otherwise, we'd just be one big soap opera, okay? So I think all of it has meaning. And I think the challenge is for us to rise above it and to work together mm -hmm. toward um, solutions that work for everybody. Mm -hmm. And I think God expects that of us. And I think um, we're failing that task mightily right now. I really do. And then, too, you, you talk about, you know, obviously Trump's picks for a certain cabinets and whatnot. Yeah. And I was thinking, too, well, obviously, you know, Congress will be, what, reelected in the next two years or so? Yeah. The, yeah. Uh, but all the House seats are up. And, so, and then in the odd year, some of the Senate seats will be up. Yeah. But there's gerrymandering. Well, talk to me more about that because that's been a hot issue around here. Yeah, it should be. What's your definition of that? Well, you know, every um, census that comes out, right. then the governor, except in North Carolina, they just changed that, but in most states, the governor and the current legislature sets the lines for the districts they're going to vote. Right. And ours are drawn like a drunk man, you know, had had too many beers at the bar after a football game, to, to make sure that whoever's in power, and the Democrats did it too when they were in okay. power, but the Republicans have drawn it so, you know, on this block there are two Republicans so they'll draw the line right there to take the Republicans. And they've gerrymandered our state so that only one district for Congress is competitive. And, uh, no, excuse me, one is Democrat. Okay. And that's James Clyburn's district. And uh, the rest of them are heavily uh, drawn for Republicans. It's not how it was intended. The government set up congressional districts so that like areas, right. rural versus an urban area or, you know, something like that, would have representation in Congress. That's what it was supposed to be. So that's not what it is. It's being challenged federally in court. And I hope to goodness very quickly it gets resolved so that uh, we can eliminate some of the gerrymandering because we've got another census coming up in two 2020, right. where um, if the Republicans maintain control of all areas of government, we're going to, you know, have the same thing happen with competitiveness gerrymandered out. Uh, yeah. Back to the future. Yeah. Is there any possibility, any glimmer of hope for you to actually run for Congress again? Well, you know, it's about my mom. I'm yeah. taking care of her. Um, if that situation should change, um, I would consider it, you know, my chances of winning are less than they were last time because this district has been gerrymandered right. to include, it was already a nine-point Republican district, and in other words, there were nine percent more uh, votes for Republicans, so uh, yeah, I came close and, and right. a lot of independents went with me. I would do it again, uh, even if I lost again, because I think the message of um, there are messages that need to get out. I would hope, I would sure run to win, and then I would hope to be a voice of, um, what's the word? I, I, I would fight against things that are detrimental, in my opinion, to the, the specialness and the beauty of this country. Mm -hmm. Walter Scott, you said this on December 6, 2016. Hung jury, mistrial? Walter Scott was 18 feet from Officer of Slager and running away when Slager fired eight times. How much clearer would it need to be? Was it one juror? More? Unfathomable. Unacceptable. Hoping for a speedy, speedy retrial, that is, and just verdict. 
when you think back to the shooting of Walter Scott to the trial, what still plays in your mind? Ah, oh, that um, the video just was. Um, I must have played it like twenty times. Uh, just the the sheer audacity of it, and it came right after a different report before the film came, before the video got right. seen about what really happened right. and um, Slager's account of it. And it was so like, oh gosh, this is this is what's going on all over America, really, when we don't have videos to document um, unfair police practices. And uh, yeah, I was, I was shocked and even more shocked when I found out that it wasn't just one person, it was several people that couldn't make up their mind about the jury trial. And people say, okay, you don't know all the facts, you didn't sit through the trial. I know, I didn't. But I, I can't find any reason in the world to justify what I saw on that tape, that somebody 18 feet away from me was not threatening my life. Obviously that person was running. Um, how could I feel a threat for my life at that point? And how could I unload all those shots into that man's back? I just, it's incomprehensible to me. And there's too much of that going on. Let me turn to Mount Mavi Emanuel. Yes. Uh, that happened obviously on June 17, 2015. And from what I remember, it was really a hot, humid day in downtown Charleston. Yes. And obviously, the night, the night of the event, we all knew what transpired. I was at home using my phone yeah. on Twitter when I heard the news. Let me ask you this. Where were you when you got the news? And when you got the news, what did you tell yourself? I, I, I remember it as if it, you know, those those defining moments where you always remember where you were. I was right. getting ready for bed when I found out about it and I had uh, the TV on and it came across and uh, it, it was a lot unknown then. That when I heard about it, there had been a shooting but they didn't talk about anybody having been killed or it, and it evolved and right. I was up till two or three o'clock in the morning just following it. I couldn't sleep right. and, it, it, and I didn't sleep that night. Um, it, a week or two weeks before, I had done a requiem on racism at Emanuel with uh, Reverend Pinckney. Right. And I had worked with Reverend Pinckney, uh, Senator Pinckney, on the Housing Trust Fund bill in 92 and kept up with him since then. He just was a, a special man. Statesman. Totally, totally. And he has that idea of government um, that you know, it's a big picture, it's all of us. He had that. Mm. And um, so, yeah. Um, and then when the details came out, it was just unbelievable. Um, I hope that this trial ends this week and that we get some resolution around that trial. What's your resolution? <laughs> this has been a challenge for me. I am not in favor of capital punishment. Okay. To me, that's premeditated murder. Mm. Um, if anybody ever deserved it, he does. Um, but I would like for him to spend the rest of his life thinking about what he did and with the possibility of change, you know, for him. Not to get out of jail if right. he changes, but to see the world in a different way than he does now. Um, I'm awed by the level of forgiveness that the people um, who experienced the loss of somebody have been able to give him. Um, I'm not sure I could do that. I'm pretty sure I couldn't. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm awed by that. And uh, so, you know, life in prison or, God forbid, the death penalty be um, the result, again, if anybody deserves the death penalty, I think this man fits the, fits the picture. Mayor John Tecklenburg. Yeah. It's been this week, actually, well, Wednesday will be his one year anniversary in office. I know that you work with him a lot on different initiatives. When you, what, let me ask you this, what's the difference between Mayor Joe Riley and Mayor John Tecklenburg in your mind? Wow, okay. Um, I think that um, Mayor Riley knew something that, that uh, Mayor Tecklenburg is discovering, and that is, um, let me sit down with everybody on city council long, one-on-one, -on -one, long before we vote so that we don't, um, you know, that touching 
the people that need to vote. I think uh, Mayor Riley may have discovered it because he, he was there 40 years. Right. Um, so he may have discovered it early, but I think uh, Mayor Tecklenburg is discovering that, that, that that's mm. a better way to go. And uh, I think his assumption is maybe one I would make, which is if I bring an idea to council that you know, everybody can agree, it makes sense, that they'll just vote for me. But that's not the way it works. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to touch bases and sure. kiss the rings and <laughs> all that kind of stuff. Right. Um, and I think I, uh, Mayor Tecklenburg is so approachable and inclusive, right. and I love that about him. I think um, we, we haven't seen in him yet, because he's only been there for a little less than a year, the, the, the vision um, that marked Mayor Riley as exceptional in the world, not just in the state or in the nation, in the world. He, he just had an extraordinary vision uh, and the inclusion. Now maybe Mayor Tecklenburg has it. We'll see. We'll uh, see. Uh, well, Linda Kettner, thank you so much for your time. Sure. I really appreciate this. Uh, always, yes. always love seeing you. Thank you. I appreciate you take that. Care. Likewise. Yeah.